So then, what's your, what's your story? How'd you, how'd you get hooked up with no foot? Tag no foot. Man, it's kind of a complicated story a little bit. Uh, I feel like uh, we've always been a part of the same world, just in different pockets. Um, I've been um, a part of the spoken word poetry community here in Mobile since 2000 and I'm gonna say 2012. Okay. So I've been around for a while, just going to open mics and stuff, and um, I joined a poetry troupe and stuff like that. I've been performing, and then um, recently uh, I had a, you know, I used to, I used to have sickle cell, sickle cell disease. Are you familiar with the? Yes, absolutely, disease? absolutely. So, so I was one of 20 people selected to be a part of a study. Mm-hmm. And uh, at NIH, the National Institutes of Health, uh, and I was one of thirteen who are part of that study who actually got cured from the treatment. Awesome. Out of twenty. Okay. Um, but when I came back, um, I came back March twelfth, two thousand nineteen. March twelfth last year, I came back home from from Maryland and stuff, and um, I had been invited to different speaking engagements, just talking about what I survived and stuff like that. And um, one, of, one of the members of my poetry troupe uh, stepped to the mic with, with Black on Black Rhyme. Mm-hmm. Um, she invited me to her show in Daphne, which, uh, which was about you know African culture and African history there. And I went there to just talk a little bit about what I went through and I shared a poem I had wrote about it. And um, I met him, I met okay. Jeremy there. Jeremy, okay. And Jeremy had seen my story, he heard about um, what I had been through and he was inspired and his inspiration inspired me and we just kind of just been feeding off of you know the fire of each other I got you ever okay. since and so uh, as and as love my, my grandma always said love is what love does mm. so you know if you love someone you put your you, you, you put your efforts what your heart is where your heart is you put your work and everything where your heart is so I saw that he was doing this podcast and I decided to support and that's what got me here um because not only do i want to see him be great but if i you know since he gave me an opportunity i want to be a part of him being great absolutely so absolutely so that's why that's why we're here um that's just my character (laughs) this is community (laughs) it's community this is community yes my character has always been to be a part of community and lift up any add value anywhere i'm at okay that's always my thing and um that's what brought me here. Uh, that beautiful poet is over there. She is a bomb spoken word artist. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> All right. You know. <laughs> well, yeah, it don't sound like it when she get on that stage. Man. I, I got you. I got but, you. But yeah, got you. Uh, that's what that's that's a little bit of my story. It's it's a lot of little you know nuances. Nuances. Gotcha. It's a lot of little nuances, but that's pretty much it. I got you. But uh, we're here for you. Okay, we lit it just like a fuse, so no need to pick and choose Welcome to 2020, what we do more than interviews The hottest beat coming through, jumping knowledge on all that you get A beak at the front of you with the truth that they offer you, yeah Hands up, we doing it for the culture To give artists and businesses more exposure Keep it real and stay solid just like a boulder It's about to go all the way down, can get no lower Chasing my dreams, know that they get no slower But if I stay running, I promise they getting closer More over success, my older And if you're sleeping on me, I'm waking them up like folders I told you, coming from the land with the tide roll well, we'll be on the whole different Though. We like to ride slow and keep our windows tinted so you really can see us like Stevie Wonder waking up with his eyes closed. Yeah, got the kind of flow that rock the boat. On my 16s and pounds of dope. And if you figure you can hang with me on the mic, then grab some rope. Matter of fact, better grab some hope while you at it. We keep it live, it's time to tune in. Turn up the sound on what you're using. It goes so hard, I think it's bruising. The show is 2020, no need to zoom in. Yeah. I really want to know about your story and what got you back to Mobile and oh, man. what got you into the mindset of wanting to not only be able to to listen, because you're a great listener, 
I noticed that about you. You are a fantastic listener. You know how to get information and infer even deeper on the things that you don't really have an understanding on so you can get a better understanding on. And you get excited about sharing what you have. You know what I mean? You get very excited about sharing and giving. And, and yo, I value that because um, that's that's how that's how change happens. That's that's the importance of history. Mm-hmm. That's how you that's how you learn from history when you have historians. You have people who uh, who are there to, to tell the tale of the tape. So well, you know, it's interesting that you say that. Um, most of why I do what I do as I've thought about it over the years, um, has been directly attributed to, to um, my family, you know, my father, my mother, my extended family, my grandmothers, my uncles, my aunts, and you know, all those people that I grew up, I grew up around in Charleston, South Carolina. And, and, and you know, my story is unique in that I am a product of the military. My father was in the army, and so, up until I retired and moved to Mobile, Alabama in 1999, I had never lived anywhere longer than about six years because we were always on the move. In 1968, my father went to Vietnam. And, you know, in the years prior to that, he was always teaching us about our history, you know, about our family history, uh, you know, and about our cultural history. You know, I can remember my father telling me about the Buffalo Soldiers and the Tuskegee Airmen and, and, you know, the struggles of Harriet Tubman and all these things my father told us. And, you know, when I got in high school, I took some studies in black history, you know, back then, you know, in the, in the, in the late 60s, the movement was on, you know, finding our identity, you yeah. know, that was all part of the struggle and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I uh, Believe it or not, I had, a, I had an opportunity to attend West Point and I turned it down. My father wasn't real happy about it, but <laughs> you know, like my mother said, uh, it was my life. And I elected to go to Talladega College. And I, you know, I immersed myself for a time in that. Um, I, <laughs> I got injured while I was in my junior year and uh, wound up having to sit out of school for about a month. You know, I was working work studies and working to put myself through school, you know, in addition to what I already had. And so, you know, being being out a month and not having work that work studies for the month and not having, you know, uh, income for the month, plus what it cost me to get back and forth. You know, I came up short and I, I, I was looking for a fallback, basically. You know, I, I was just going to sit out that semester and work the semester and work the summer. And I, I got introduced to Manuel, Manuel, Manuel Labor. And I decided that, you know, there's got to be more, li- more to life than this. And I, and I began to think, well, I need a fallback. And uh, I looked at the military again. And I said, well, you know, I can kill two birds with one stone. I can, I can uh, get money for school and I can get a trade so that if I ever found myself in that position again, I could sustain myself. Smart. And so I wound up and, I, and I, I chose the United States Coast Guard for a myriad of reasons. One, the, the major being that it was a real job. We weren't training for something that we hope never happened yeah you know we had a re- it had a real job and i and i got in there and i loved it but part of that was i found myself being the real minority i would be at units where i would be one of one or one of two or one of three and and you know you got to understand when i went in in the in the late 70s you know affirmative action was new on the on the on the scene and and you know, there was still the inerrant, uh, inherent racism that was there and discriminations and, you know, and, and the assumptions that we were there because, you know, the, the qualifications were, you know, watered down so we can get in. And, and, you know, I constantly had to fight that stigmatism about that. And so it, it gave me a heart for my black brothers and sisters when I saw them and they had to, they had to go through the same struggles and we struggled together and we, f- and we quickly found out that if we were gonna be successful, we had to come together. And come together meant not only sharing information but it also meant holding one another accountable. Okay? If I see you, if I see you doing something crazy, then, then, then the love that I have for you is gonna, gonna compel me to come to you and say, hey man, you about to, you about to make life hard for yourself. Mm. 
you know, when we would get some of the younger guys that would come in who, you know, who didn't quite have to go through what we went through, you know, we had to kind of sit them down and go, hey, guy, listen, this is, this is how we got here, you know. And, and so that being said, I, I just, when I had, you know, after I had a family and I had children and I'm looking and I'm seeing that the more things change, the more they, they stayed the same, it was like, you know what? There's got, to, there's got to be some meaningful changes made in our, in our community. And we got to stop waiting for other folks to do for us what we need to do for ourselves. And, and so it, it put me in a position where, you know, now I, I had this desire to talk to younger folks and, 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 and get them to understand the importance of history and the importance of community and, and the importance of holding one another accountable. Then along the way, I got saved and, and, and uh, you know, I learned about the Lord Jesus and I learned about his word. And, and, and I've never been one that I just fall for something hook, line and sinker. I, I've always been one that I investigate things and I look at it. I look at it critically. And, and, and I found that in all of the things that I searched out and I looked at Islam, I looked at, you know, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. And I found what I really found was that that. The Lord Jesus was the only one who provided the true answers for the questions that I had and what he said the way I should conduct my life was right in line with the things that I desire to do in my community. And so that naturally kind of led me into ministry and then that ministry led me into jail ministry and, 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 and ultimately into the pastorship. And so here I am now. I'm just doing what God has put before me to do, and that is to help people to understand, one, God's ways, and two, the, the wiles of the enemy. You know, the word says, be as wise as the serpent, but as gentle as the lamb. And so in order to be as wise as that serpent, you've got to know his game. You've got to see what his whole card is, okay? It don't mean you go up and now you want to punch his lights out. It just means that you gotta come up with a strategy to counteract what he's trying to do. And so that really brings us to the subject that we're really here for, and that is what's going on in Mobile City and the things that folks behind the scenes are trying to, trying to do. Now, I, you know, I, I've asked this question of a lot of people that I've run into, and I ask them, do you know what the Zogby Act is? And maybe out of 20 people that I've run into, I might run into one person who really knows, other than people that are in government. And in, and in actuality, there are a lot of people that work in the government house down there, and they don't know what it is. They don't even know what they hear about it, but they don't know the details and what it means and how it impacts our community. Because they haven't taken the time yeah. to, one, investigate their history and know what, and know what was going on before them, yeah. and two, they don't take an interest in what's going on in, in city government. Now. What we need to understand, you know, as glamorous as the national federal government may look, the federal government has the least amount of impact on the daily life of, 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 a, of a citizen. The governments that have the absolute impact are your city and your county and your state in that order. City having the greatest, the state having the next, I mean, I'm sorry, county having the next and the state having, having the, and then it moves to the federal government. Why am I telling you this? In the city, they enact legislations, ordinances, and rules that govern what you do on a regular basis from, the, from when you put your garbage out to what color you can paint your house, whether you can or cannot cut down a tree, where you got to go to vote, where you go to school, how your kids, I mean, everything about your daily life is governed by city government. And the problem is, is that most people don't take an active role or participate in that government. Government, they just let those people in City Hall do whatever they want to do, and then they've got to deal with the consequences of it. Prior to 1985, the city of Mobile had what they called city commissioners. If I'm not mistaken, I believe there were five of them, and they were elected at what they called at large. In other words, they didn't represent any particular geographic or group of, geographic location or group of people. They were just elected en masse by the people. Unfortunately, they were all Caucasian. 
There was a lawsuit that was uh, pursued. The federal government got involved and they deemed that there were violations of people's civil rights that were going on in the, in the city and in the county of Mobile and there was action that had to be taken and the result of that action for the city, excuse me, for the city of Mobile was the Zogby Act. It was a piece of state legislation that established the current uh, city government that we, that we live under here in the, city of, in the city of Mobile, which is strong council, weak mayor. So what does that mean? That the duties were divided between the, between the, the city council and the mayor to, along the same lines that Congress and the executive branches are, are, de, are, are yeah. developed, but the council had the majority of say so. Now, at that, the, there was a, the city was divided into seven districts, all right? And in that Zogby Act, basically what they said was how each piece of the government was supposed to work, how legislation in the government was supposed to be made, who could do what, who had what responsibilities. Every detail of city government is outlined in that Zogby Act. One particular uh, uh, article in that Zogby Act talks about um, what is called the supermajority, and that's probably the conversation that everybody's hearing about, yeah. you know, that they want to go from a supermajority to a simple majority. And the way it's being pitched out there is being pitched that if we go to the, the simple majority, it's going to speed up the city processes. Okay, it sounds good until you start digging into details. Well, the first thing you need to ask is, why was the supermajority instituted in the first place? Well, it was instituted because when they looked at, looked at, the, uh, at the possible demographics of the city that they found out that the Caucasian was gonna be the ma majority and, and others were gonna be the minority. And so they said, instead of it being a, a simple majority, it's gotta be a super majority, which means five of the seven must agree. Now, if you look at the current makeup of the city council right now, you'll find that there are four seats that are held by Caucasian and three that are, that are held by other minorities, all right? Right now, if there's legislation that's passed, then one of the three has to agree with the other four. That keeps anybody from getting rolled over. If they go to a simple majority instead of a super majority, then what's going to happen is now these four can overrule these three and there's the potential that the black voter and the black constituent will not have a voice in city government. Now, I'm not trying to say that anybody's trying to take away anybody's rights. That's not my point and I'm not, I'm not trying to get into the politics of it. But what I do know is that the potential for abuse will be there if this, if this is allowed to happen. It was placed there for a reason. It was a safeguard to keep the stronger from overpowering and taking advantage of the weaker. And we don't need to remove that check. So let me tell you what's happening. Right now there's a move, there's a petition that's circling around in the city of Mobile. And the Zogby Act outlines how, how it can be changed. And one of the provisions is that if they could get a petition with the signatures of 10% of the voters that voted in the previous election, then that legislation to change the, the provision of the Zogby Act could then be put on a ballot for the, for the rest of the citizens to vote on. Now notice I said 10% of the people who voted in the last election, not 10% of the voters on the voters' rolls. And so now all they really need is a thousand vote, a thousand signatures in order to put this on November's ballot. That tells you, that should tell you that, about how many scary. people voted. The fact that they even did it that way in the first place should be afraid, should be, should frighten you in the first place. You know, because like you said, one of the main fears is, it's not saying that we would get manipulated, but we'd be vulnerable to, Absolutely. We'll be vulnerable to it, and you don't want to be vulnerable to where 
your community isn't protected. You don't have people representing you that can protect you from things that are not in your interest. Absolutely. So the fact that they're doing that that way kind of shows you that they have a plan that is going to be great for them, but awful for us. Well, you know, I, like I said, once again, I'm not, I'm not trying to interpret anybody's motives. You know, I, I, I can only look at what I see happening and, and infer certain things, but, you know, that doesn't make it necessarily yeah. fact. And, I, and so I don't want to say that because I don't want to I don't want to disparage anyone's, you know, character or, or their mentality because I don't know. You know, yeah. who knows the heart of men? Yeah. But the only thing I can say is I, I can take what I see and the totality of it and infer, you know, okay, this can be good or this can be bad, but when, I'm look, when I look at this thing, I'm going, this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. But what makes it not a good thing, in my perspective, isn't, you know, like what I previously stated, that we're vulnerable for anyone to, to come and attack us or, or you know, take away what rights we, we have. Uh, what, what scares me about it is, is the fact that we don't have enough people, especially in our generation, who care. And that's what makes us so vulnerable, is that we don't have enough people who are involved in city politics to, con to, to continue to keep us in a position to where, hey, you can't do what you want. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's what's scaring. Well, let me ask you a question. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Okay. Who is your city councilman? I have no idea. How about you? Hmm. That's telling, isn't it? Yeah. So if you don't know who your city councilman is, then you have no idea when they have their city councilman town home hall meetings, do you? Nope. So how you how do you think you're going to find out what's going on in the city if you don't even know who your representative is, let alone when their when their meetings are? Yeah. I'm just saying. That's what's so terrifying. That's, That's the reason why I feel like this conversation needs to be had so that we can we can get in arms and in action. Because one of the things, one of the narratives here in Mobile that you will hear from pretty much anyone from our community is Mobile ain't got nothing going on. Ain't nothing going on in Mobile. Ain't nothing happening in Mobile. Mobile, this, that, and the third. You know, you hear a lot of negativity, but you don't hear any conversations about why and exactly. you don't hear any conversations about how, and you don't hear any conversations about what we should do about it. All you hear about is how awful it is, and they think about, I'm going to move to Atlanta, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, I'm going to go somewhere where they're making real money and stuff like that. But the thing is that I've noticed from being, being around you know, the same uh, colleagues is, is that the resources are there. They're just not being, there's just too many disparities. Absolutely. The resources are there. The, the opportunities in Mobile are there. We're just not aware of it. As simple as the fact that we don't know who our city councilmen are. We don't know. You know, but if we knew, we would, we would know that there are options here in Mobile. Mobile isn't as bad as we think it is. We're just ignorant. Well, let's put it this way. I'm a transplant. I chose to be here. Yeah. I, I like this city. I love this city. Yeah. I, I, love the, I love the feel. You know, I, and I guess one of the things that, that really drew me to Mobile was I fell in love with the black community here. Yeah. But the problem is, is the, the Mobile that I knew in the 90s and the togetherness that was in the community back in 1990 is not there anymore. Yeah. Um, we've fallen into the selfish thing of me, 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 and we don't, we're not taking the time to, to, to be our brother's keeper, and that's a problem. You know, we don't communicate anymore. You know, it was amazing. Um, about three Senior Bowls ago, I had a cousin, second cousin of mine, who actually played in the Senior Bowl. And, and we sat down at a local restaurant for dinner. And, and, and the tables, you know, there were three groups of tables. And it was funny how it fell. And it fell by, by age. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm sitting at the table with my uncle, you know. And so that was that 50 and above group. And then the next table was like, you know, the 40s to to 30 somethings and then the other table over there was like the you know the the early 30s to down on on below right and the majority of the verbal communication that was going on was at the old folk table we were engaging in conversations and then there was even less at the other at that at that you know 40 to to, to you know early, late uh, 20s table you know and and I looked over and 
they're having half conversations and the other half time they're on their, on their mobile device. And then I looked at that other table over there, there was no conversation. Well, there was conversation, but there wasn't any verbal. They were actually, and I couldn't get this. I mean, it just, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I guess I'm just an old dude, you know? Yeah. And it was like, they're literally having a conversation, either texting or Snapchatting or whatever they were using. And they were having that conversation and they were looking and laughing and looking at each other and they wouldn't even say a word. They would just, mm -hmm. and smile. And I'm going, whoa. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder why, you know, that there's this big gap because those 20 somethings didn't want to talk to me. You know, they would say something out of politeness and out of courtesy, but they didn't really want to hear what I had to say. And then when I looked at what they were really talking about, it kind of mirrored what we see in media today. Who's doing who? Who's doing what? You know, what celebrity is this? And all the things that all the things that I perceive to be the negative things that we that we advance in our culture that serve that that don't serve us.